Howdy, folks. Let's Talk Music is about learning from experienced professional musicians about them sharing their experiences in their own words. Whether they are composers, educators, performers, the goal is to help viewers understand some of the nuances of life in the music business and perhaps help viewers develop a better understanding of a career that they might be considering. Now, Dean Crepain is a Seattle-based veteran songwriter, speaker, music producer, worship leader, and author. His recent books, Demystifying the Q and Demystifying the Genre, both reached number one on Amazon's Recording and Sound and Music Business bestsellers charts. Dean himself was a multi-instrumentalist with thousands of placements in television, ads, and film. As a songwriter, Dean has earned gold and platinum records, and he's earned the John Brahaney Songwriting Award. Dean is also the co-founder or founder of a number of businesses, and today makes his living writing music. So as always, be sure to check out the links in the description below so you can support our guest and the channel. Now, let's talk music. Well, Dean, it's so good to see your smiling face and the in technology we have today. I, I love that we can use Zoom and see each other. Uh, we've been working together, uh, collaborating on some great music you've written, and I'm so thankful you reached out to me for some saxophone stuff. Um, you are a very well-respected person in the music sync business. You've been doing it forever. You, dare I say you're an, uh, an elder in the sync music business. Um, I you know, met you. In a lot of ways, yeah. I'm an <laughs> <laughs> I met you uh, through Taxi. We're both yep. uh, very big supporters of Taxi, and um, the folk, the other folks I've interviewed already for this series are, are equally as as favorable of Taxi, uh, yeah. and they yeah. the value that it provides. And you're like an ambassador of Taxi, um, and you got an early, I think. So um, I, I covered your bio on the intro. Um, we're going to talk about the things that you've done, but let's, let's, let's go back in time for a second. I want to kind of get to know you a little bit. What question, and I got five questions for you. I'm kind of borrowing Adonis Electris's five question concept for interviews. Um, let's talk about, you know, what are your earliest memories musically? What are your earliest musical memories and, and what were those musical life experiences and how do they lead you to becoming a composer and, and making money for a living as a comp composer, are you are are you formally musically trained? Talk about your earliest musical experiences and how you progressed and became a composer. My, you know, my story is probably not that much different than a lot of musicians. You know, I I, I uh, fell in love with music back in the I guess in the late sixties, early seventies, and. Um, yeah, I am that old. And, <laughs> and uh, um, you know, with all kinds you have of have your hair still, which is amazing to me. It's, it is, you know, it's all fake. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, um, fell in love with music with with all the bands uh, of the '60s, the Motown, the Beatles, the Stones, uh, the '70s, the singer songwriter, the all that kind of stuff, and and just fell in love with it. And had bands early, had bands in uh, uh, junior high and high school. Uh, you know, had rock bands or, or whatever we were playing at that time and uh, like a lot of people I did all that thing when when I was in college I got turn, really turned on that was my first uh, um, really introduction to jazz because a lot of the classes were jazz class jazz harmony classes jazz and uh, that, I started to fall in love with jazz there but I kept doing rock kept doing pop kept doing those things um, Wait, were, I, you, were you a music major I was not. I mean, I was a psychology major. Okay. And, uh, um, but yeah, music. So I, I really wasn't, you know, at that point was I, I think I want the schools I wanted to go to. I just couldn't afford. I wanted to go to Berkeley. I wanted to go to North Texas state. Yeah. I just couldn't afford going out of state and doing all that. Understand. So, uh, so I stayed here in state in Washington state um, and just kind of, you know, hopped around with colleges but uh, did did that and um, then went right into bands and also got into recording. There was a, one of the seminars that came uh, through one of my colleges. Um, a guy was doing jingles and I thought, oh, that'd be cool uh, to do jingles for radio. So anyway, long story short, got played in bands, started getting in bands, uh, started recording um, with various groups around Seattle um, in late late the oh gosh i can't remember the year but i started uh recording jingles i actually started a jingle company called wow. spectrum productions and we ran for about three years until you know we were all young and not business majors until we ran out of money okay. and uh, but we did tons of jingles um basically around the northwest probably washington idaho oregon uh, maybe over to colorado did some stuff 
um, had Any big spots that some older West Coast folks might recognize. You no, know, we did a the the na one national commercial that we did was a Dankin jewelry that at that time was still going on. I don't. I, they might have had a few hundred <laughs> stores. I don't know if they they do anymore. That's an old old franchise, but. Uh, yeah, that was, um, you know, got into that, fell in love with recording. And then when the when recording gear got affordable, I'll move up the time frame. Um, I started buying the Fostex gear, the Fostex 8 track, the Fostex mm -hmm. B16 uh, gear, started doing that and opened a small demo studio here in Seattle. Uh, so I really got into recording, started kind of learning. I had also gone and in, in to classes at recording studios and learned how to record there and was recording at various studios around here all the while still playing in bands. Yeah. And, but having this in and throughout, throughout all of that, I always wrote songs. I mean, I can't tell you how many thousands of songs I've written over, over the years. So I think I didn't know it at the time because I was so enamored with wanting to become a star, yeah. but I think where my real love is writing, uh, writing music, composing music. So you know, all the way through there, uh, um, some record deal. Uh, we had a, I was with a band um, in the 80s. Um, some, some sad stories. I was with a band called the McCoy McCowan Band. Uh, a couple of guys from the Ohio Players were in that band, uh, recorded okay. some stuff, got, had three record labels bidding on us. Solar, Atlantic, and Motown are the manager at that time, Benjamin Ashburn, unfortunately died uh from a heart attack and all the record deals offers went he was he was because he had done the uh i think commodores that it was his wow, okay. act at that time uh so that way you know went on um a couple other indie deals led me to uh um just keep recording and recorded tons of bands with tons of bands with tons of artists um uh, and when when i discovered taxi is when things really kind of turned for me um, in a, in a different way. Um, because I, as you know, cause you're, you're like me, you've been to, to the taxi road rallies and all that. Um, uh, it's just such a great education place and a great networking place and a great, uh, place to pitch your music. So, um, really in the early two thousands, I started pitching music and started getting in TV shows. And when I got my first Royal, I still wasn't, that wasn't the business I was going into. I still wanted to be songwriting for artists, but that wasn't working very well. Yeah. And, and, um, and the record business was starting to change because of uh, um, uh, Napster and streaming music and the CD music, CD industry started collapsing. You, you know, you used to be able to go to Nashville, sign with a publisher, never have a hit but get album cuts and make a hundred thousand bucks a year. Yeah. That's all gone. Yeah. It's either hits or nothing. It's feast or famine these days for songwriters um, in the big leagues, in the, in the major labels, but I uh, got into taxi when I got my first royalty check from a show called one life to live <laughs> uh, uh, a soap opera. I went, Oh, you can make, money at this and well, that's uh, broadcast networks those are, the, those are the ones that pay the best yeah, yeah that's yeah. right i mean india and i think the first song in the first episode played three different times that oh, same wow. thing, cut back to the scene and i went are you kidding me you can make a thousand bucks yeah or more in one day off of one song in one episode that yeah. played five days a week wait a minute i need to start learning about this okay case. so that gets me to my second question then so yeah. You, you you spend a time wanting to be a rock star. You've got the gift of writing music, but also writing songs. I lyrics are something I just can't deal with. And then when you record vocals, you got to find a good vocalist because I certainly don't sing. You got to get a good vocal recording. You got to get the lyrics in the first place. It adds a whole layer of complexity. So you've got the the skill set to do instrumentals and vocals. So you found Taxi, which is interesting because the previous two interviews I've done both said the same thing, and you got an early. So. Is Taxi, how, was that your gateway to sync music? How did you get into sync music? Yeah, that was really my gateway into sync music. I uh, I had, uh, um, yeah, it was because of that show and, and that I really started pursuing it. And then I, I hadn't gone to a Taxi Road Rally, a Taxi Conference before that. For your viewers that don't know, Taxi has a thing every November. It's called the Ro Taxi Road Rally. And it's a music conference where thousands of us all get together and, and listen and learn. And, right. And, it's, it's so energizing, so motivational. Yeah, it's a great, great thing. And, um, and, and and that's when I first started going there and really started learning the sync. I really didn't know the sync business before that. Right. I started learning through Taxi. 
um, met a couple publishers, kept pitching, got to more publishers and, you know, started my first two, three, four years, just started learning and, and pitching. And, and I also learned that um, songs, um, uh, instrumentals, uh, 95% of the music or 90 or 95% of the music used in film and TV does not have lyrics in it. Right. Right. You know, I mean, for people that are lyricists, that are songwriters, man, if you get a song on there and that song gets played and it's in the foreground, that's a payday. Exactly. And it might break your career as an artist. It might yeah. you get a, in a hit show with a, a song that's played up front. Um, you know, you might be able to go on local tours and, and do that kind of stuff. So that's a, that's a great thing to strive for. But I just found the instrumental thing was really a way to build a business. So I just dove into that. And I think I'm going on a tangent here. I forgot. Oh, this is great. We got plenty of time. We're good. Yeah. yeah. No. So I think, I think, you know, I want to double click on that. I, I, oh, I hate saying that. That's an IT phrase. Let's double click on That's that. Good. That's um, good. Uh, because I think there's a misperception out there in the market as to what taxi does. And, and it's not a place where you go to be discovered as an artist. It's right. a place where you go to learn about the sync business and meet libraries. You've met libraries there. I've met libraries there. For me, Taxi was the foundation to my education in the sync business. When I joined Taxi in 2015, I got in way late. You got in a lot earlier. Um, I had decades of performing experience. I've got a. I went to North Texas. I got a music education. Dedic a year, decades of performance, you know, gigs and, and 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 things of that sort. But I knew zero about the sync business. And yeah. everything I learned about that came from Taxi, from the forums, from the people I met, like you, the from the rally. Uh, the, the mentors that paid it forward. Now I'm trying to pay it forward to the new wave of folks there. It's a very, very valuable community. So um, sometimes they take a hit, you know, the comment sections in this, in this internet are just often the dredges of society. And, and uh, it, it, I can't endorse a taxi enough as far as how it helped me get my foundation uh, and taught me about the sync music business. And it seems like the great Dean Crepain <laughs> learned the sync music. Based I, on you know, Paul, Paul, I agree with you totally. At Taxi, I've told people this for the last probably five, six, seven years. Taxi for sync business, Taxi is the university is the university you want to go to, and it's costs way less than a university. You know, you're gonna drop a thousand bucks at a college these days. And well, you can you can go to the. I mean, when I first discovered Taxi, I want to say 2014. Yeah, I was musically homeless. Both the bands I was in broke up for varying reasons. And I found Taxi through an advertisement advertisement in Songwriter Magazine. And so I did what most folks do. Oh, let's Google it. Let's find out what's going on. And I found a bunch of negative, oh, it's a scam, blah, blah, blah. But no, I went to the forums, which is free. You don't even pay to be on the forums, yeah. forums.taxi.com. And I started, you know, just lurking for a while and seeing the comments and then hearing the music folks are submitting and then seeing the responses that were being given and feedback and how positive encouraging and useful that feedback was and i thought this is nothing like the naysayer comments i see in social media this is real i'm going to pay for the membership i'm going to dive in and honestly it was the best thing i did as far as my music sync career goes so for those watching i mean I, we are not i'm not paid by michael lascow and tax this yeah. is yeah. just I'm, I'm a believer of the product um no, either i'm i'm not paid uh, either and you know and i've got hundreds of thousands of dollars that i've made because of my relationship with tax and exactly. so, you know, it, it's, it's a education, it's a way. And I will, let me rewind just a second. Really interesting that when I first started going to taxi, uh, the road rally in the early 2000s, 2000s the record business was still happening. So you yeah. go around and there were people trying to get record deals there because there were record, you know, A&R people there. And, you know, all these little pop stars walking around all made up and dressed up and everything <laughs> walking around. But by yeah. probably 2007, 2008, that had shifted dramatically because that, industry really crashed yeah now uh where do you go for to make uh you know 50 to 150 thousand bucks a year the you know kind of middle class of the record business um well sync is one way to do it right and, uh, and taxi was the best education uh you know i had so yeah it's it's that's that's really how i learned through that through all of my peers there through you know a lot of the people you know uh Matt, uh, Matt Hurt, uh, John Mazze, Chuck right. Schlager, you know, a lot of these people, we were all, you know, getting together, you, you know, everybody's just exchanging ideas and we're exchanging. Yeah. Information. It's the greatest free exchange of valuable information that I have 
that I've ever been. And it's around. incredibly, almost entirely positive. And we want to help each other out. It's not this close to the vest, screw yeah. you. I don't want to help you at all. It's very, very helpful. So yeah, I can't, we're, yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. gushing we about do. it. I don't mean to, but it, it helped we me. We could go on and on. Yeah. We could. <laughs> so I'm going to go to question three. So if I remember correctly, in the past, I and some others have maybe have teased you with some of your choices and the instruments that you use using uh -huh. an older doll or an older piano library. So, if I remember correctly, you use you're using sometimes older gear. And I may have changed recently, yeah. but yeah. It, it's increased incredibly easy to to get caught up in the panic of getting the latest software libraries, the latest sample packs. What are your thoughts on the whole? It's not the gear; it's the ear concept in writing good music. You know, I um. A lot of people will disagree with me on this, but I'm I'm not a, a I like new gear. I like cool gear. I like all that. But the one of the problems with new gear when you after you've got enough to make a cue, yeah, um, which is it really takes very limited uh, uh, instruments, instrumentation, virtual instruments to make a cue these days. But um, you can just get enamored with buying more and more gear and to really learn gear inside and out, it takes months and months and months. So you'll never, you'll never create a cue. And um, so I've got, yeah, I've got some really good, I think Omnisphere is one of the greatest pieces of gear. I've got, you know, some uh, uh, Spectrosonics, uh, 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 even the stuff we just worked on, I was using upright bass, uh, the Trillions upright bass, uh, which I think is a, a really- What do you like for piano? Yeah, the, my piano on that, this and this speaks right to your point. The piano that I was using on that track is uh, from about a 15, 18 year old virtual instrument called Sample Tank 2. Wow. And I've I've learned how to use that piano and that piano. I've got other I've got newer pianos that really sound great. But I'm as a guy who plays jazz, who never took a piano lesson in his life. I mean, I played jazz for years and years and just just self-taught. But I have a really way too heavy touch. Yeah. Be, yeah. So some of these wonderful, bright, beautiful uh, virtual instrument pianos, um, I they just don't sound right when I play them. So I use. Uh, I'm sorry about the sun that's shining. That's, in that's okay. But uh, um, Wait, you're I, in Seattle. The sun is out. That, I thought that didn't happen. The sun is. Man, it was snowing yesterday, <laughs> and the sun is out today. So uh, uh, yeah, it was really cold today. But yeah, I'm. I'm. My feeling, uh, it, it, yeah, it's not the gear, it's the ear. It's it's the ear. It's the ear. It's the ear. Once in a while, it is the gear. And you do have to have decent gear because the quality is so good. You have to you can't have, sound dated. That's important. Yeah, yeah, you can't sound dated. But some of the older instruments, like this, this sample tank I just mentioned, um, and people tease me about that all the time, but it's got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of sounds on it. But there are literally probably five sounds on that that I use and that's yeah. all but they're sounds that I've learned in and out upside down I know how to make them really work in tracks and that's that's the key that's the key with any virtual instrument whether it's old or new you know everybody was talking years ago about east west strings and they are brilliant they're a brilliant string section but if you don't know how to articulate a violin or a viola or something yeah. um one of the best things we did in uh, we had this thing called Composer Camp some years ago, and we all uh, would hang out at uh, uh, Chuck Schlachter's house down in Nashville, and there were about 12, 15 of us that would hang out down there. And one of the people we had come uh, that came down there was Lydia Ashton. I think you know Lydia. Yes. And um, she brought her viola, and she we had one session where she just showed us all the articulations. She's right. a real player. The yeah. articulations that they would do to make that viola. Now, I'm never going to be a, do a solo viola and make it sound right. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, like with you, I'm going to hire a real sax player <laughs> if I need real sax parts, uh, real sax solos. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can do a lot of hits and stuff with some of the sections I have, but, um, but learning those articulations is really important. No matter if you have the old gear or if you have the new gear yet, you, you have to learn how to, you have to learn how to play the instrument, even if it's a software instrument. I just gave some feedback to someone earlier today, a beautiful ambient track. Uh, and they brought in a flugelhorn, and it was a wonderful sample. I mean, it was that was a fan. I wish my flugelhorn tone was that good. Um, it, it was a fantastic sample and played fairly well, but the phrasing was wrong. It was the infinite infinite bow syndrome, where there's a really really long phrase, and yeah. no player is going to play that and keep yeah. on going. Yeah. And I gave him some feedback, saying, "Hey, try to sing that phrase you're playing, and take note." where you pause to breathe because horn players have to breathe. And yep. so uh, you've got to learn how to play 
if it's a drum set, you can't hit hi hat snare crash at the same time. Right. Like it, you can only right. do two, not three. You got two sticks. Marimba <laughs> can only do so many things. Piano, you only have ten fingers. Um, right. You got to treat each software instrument as if it's a real instrument and treat it, you know, play it as you would with with physical capability as well as breathing and things of that sort. So that's so imp- that's so here. important. That's so important, Paul. And and you make a great point. And in this day and age, it's easy to learn. We got this wonderful thing called Google and YouTube. Yes. You, you know, I wanted to learn how to. I wasn't getting the sounds for some of the jazz stuff, the cocktail jazz stuff I was doing. I wasn't getting the right sounds out of virtual instrument. Um, I wasn't getting the swing out of the snare sound. Yeah. So I decided I'm going to learn how to play brushes on yeah. the, and get a snare and play that. And I just went on there learn. I, same thing with the slide guitar. I did a lot of slide guitar with some of the uh, uh, Southern rock stuff I did, like for Duck Dynasty and those shows. Um, I didn't know how to play slide guitar, so I went online and learned how to play, yeah. learn what they do. And with every instrument, I have the good fortune of I spent years playing in bands. Yeah. So I spent years sitting next to a drummer and a bass pl- player and, and, and on and on. So I know what drummers do. I know what, ba- you know, over 4,000 nights in, in clubs. Yeah. In gigs, I, I, I know that's ingrained in me, but it's really easy to learn what they do. And if you don't, then, then if you, if you, you know, hire somebody to hire somebody to play a, a you know, if you in, and if you don't want to hire somebody, I don't want to spend 75 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever you're going to pay them. Um, you might want to second guess, you know, if if my track is not worth hiring somebody for 100 bucks to play an instrument on it, well, I better say, you know, I better not submit that track. You know, I better believe in my tracks enough that I'm, I'm willing to hire somebody if I need somebody on that track. Yeah, you know, we've got as older musicians, we've got the benefit of having performed live regularly these days. It's hard to find live gigs, and there's 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 less options for younger musicians. Um, we all paid our dues, paying for the playing playing for the door at a club somewhere, um, you know, doing weddings, doing rock gigs, doing cruise ships, doing whatever. We've all paid our dues, and there it seems to be fewer options for younger musicians to get that interaction and sitting next to a a drummer or a very loud bass player or a good horn section and a great vocalist and knowing when to play versus not when to play. Um, it is tougher. So YouTube does help a ton, but nothing beats live experience performing nothing live. Beats so. Live experience, no, no. And and you know the the younger players today, um, somebody that are the younger musicians that might not even be a player. If you're 12 years old to 22 years old, you're probably going to do EDM way better than I can do it. Yeah, now. yeah. Like because that's all they've been li- they've been living that they've been living that thing and and. You know, there. If I I I listen to, I like to flip around on old uh, terrestrial radio, traditional radio stations, and see what different genres are happening. So I'll spend a, maybe a couple weeks, for example, in pop music. And uh, when I listen to pop mu- pop radio these days, man, that uh, you know, half of the stuff that's not a real drummer or a real bass player, right. you know. And so now I'm having to learn new skills. If I want to do pop, I got to learn. How to make those? I can't just bring a you know Motown bass in there and, and a right. you know 1978 drum kit in there. No, right. I, I, have to, I have to learn what they're doing. And you know, and I think that's a point maybe you're getting to here is all this. The templates are out there. Whatever kind of music you want to do, what, the templates are out there for us to learn, for us to study, for us to reverse engineer whatever song it is and learn how to play that. And um, that's what we have to do. You absolutely have to do that if you don't have the benefit that you and I had of playing night after night after night in various band gigs right. and, and being around that. So, um, you know, yeah. And, and it's out there. We can do that. People so can learn the stuff. You've kind of nicely transitioned me to my next question. So you do lots of different things. You produce different genres. You're a songwriter. you got a musical education. You, you found a Tri-West, uh, all screen music. You did Spectrum. Um, in, in one of your bios, I found there's a quote that I was so happy to read. Because it no. made me feel not alone anymore. Um, it, it it was from a library that we were both members of. And in your bio, it says, and I'm quoting, in the music business, writers are constantly told to concentrate on only one or two genres of music, comma, Dean didn't listen. So <laughs> I find right. myself in a similar situation because one of the things you hear at the rally when you meet with supervisors and producers, don't tell someone you do everything. It's very off-putting. And I completely understand that. I happen to be a person that does lots of genres just yeah. like you. So yeah. it, it's easy to get caught up in the, oh, 
I could do circus music. I could do dramedy. I could do drones. I could do emotional piano. And um, unless you have the right experience and skills and tools, you're probably going to waste lots of your time. And full disclosure, my first two years at Taxi, I wasted because I I submitted to tons of genres that I wasn't okay. You're okay. Glad to hear it's not just me. Um, so I preach to to new folks in the industry. Stick with the one that dance with the one that rung you, as we say in Texas. Um, focus on what you're good at. Don't waste time trying to find new things. Establish a reputation for yourself as a solid EDM producer or a great classical pianist or a great country singer or whatever your thing is. Focus on that. Build a catalog and they will find you as long as you've got your act together and, and, and don't burn bridges and know how to yeah. run your business. Um, what are your thoughts on for those new again paying it forward on how to focus or, or or the concept of focus on what your strengths are do you think that focusing is a good thing and, and, and how would, would would you suggest someone start uh and, and get attention in, in it's versus the way we both did it, it was you know spraying and praying hoping we find yeah. shotgun music everywhere you know i you know i i, I couldn't agree more it, it in fact i ended up getting in through one one genre yeah. And it's a genre I would have been doing for a while is neo soul music, actually vocal stuff. Wow. Okay. And, and um, I was really good at that genre. And and that's what I would tell anybody that's new is, is try to discern, you know, people are usually probably good at really probably the best in maybe two genres when they're starting, yeah. out, whatever it is. If you're a singer songwriter and that's what you do and that's what you love, then start out with that. If you're a, you know, if you're you're a tension person, you always listen to tension. You always love to. It, you, you are know. you are what you listen to or what you grew up yes. with. You know, yes, the influences what? are what I mean. I grew up. My dad was a jazz head. I grew up around, you know, the, the saxophone greats, but Oscar Peterson as well. So I was a bebop guy. Oscar Peterson, Charlie Parker, Phil Woods, Cannibal Adderley, and those are my strengths. That's my roots. Uh, other folks grew up on country or on rock, and so uh, I, I, did you grow up in around a jazz influence? Is that what you've always loved? Or? really wasn't until I was in college that, uh, you know, I mean, my, uh, you know, I have uh, my mom's uh, it was Nat King Cole all the time. Nat oh, King well, Cole, great choice. Cole, yeah. Which well, I guess is, you know, for the, with, a, with a couple of exceptions, it's Vogel jazz. But um, I don't know that lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer is, is jazz. But, yeah. but but yeah, he was definitely well, so he was an amazing pianist. Oscar Peterson, oh, yeah, Oscar well, and he well, were good friends. He was an yeah. amazing give up. There is there was a one library that we're both familiar with that that had uh, some years ago had asked for uh, Oscar Peterson trio and I, or not Oscar Peterson. Yes. They had asked for uh, Nat King Cole trio. Wow. And I didn't even know what that was. And, th and it was there was no drummer in it. It was guitar, bass and yes. playing keyboards. Oh, my God. It took me years to realize that the Oscar Peterson trio albums my dad was playing had no drummer. <laughs> yes. And, and the and the and I had to end this up back to our studying, yep. studying whatever genre I submit. I wanted to submit, um, but I really had to study it. And when I really researched Nat King Cole's piano playing, his cording when he's singing, his cording is up about a half octave, almost an octave sometimes of where really? you would naturally comp. And I went, oh, I got to move everything up and put all my inversions up a little bit if I really want it to sound like this. And it finally dawned on me why is that most of his singing range was right in that kind of G below middle C to G above middle C that I like to comp chords in a yeah. lot of times. And so he was playing out and maybe the guitar player was playing there too, but he was leaving space for his vocal to really come through. And yeah, anyway, I had to study that and then change all of my piano playing to be able to play there. But let's, let's, I want to dig into that. This wasn't planned, but first real quick question. Was prime was piano your primary instrument? I see a guitar over your shoulder. What, oh, was it, was, it was guitar, guitar from yeah. Oh, really? I, I I picked up piano when I started getting into jazz. Just started playing it, and and but yeah, okay. I I took guitar lessons way 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 back when I was young for a few years. Piano came on later then. Piano came on later. Okay, so let's go back to that. So you just said a bunch of things that I really appreciate. You talked about Nat King Cole's vocal range and where that was in the keyboard, and you listened and you adjusted. This is one of the things I've done some videos on this in the past about how to learn new genres or how to study music. And I think more folks new to the business need to understand what's needed to learn a genre. Um, so can we talk a little bit about how you study 
music, like maybe you got into swampy guitar or you got into EDM. Oh, Is there a certain thing you do to learn a new genre? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the best, one of the things that really got me going in sync is some of the best advice I ever got. It was at a taxi road rally in one of the first years I was there. And it was during their luncheon. They have the, where everybody, right, meets, right. one person there. And the guy there, he had been doing sync for a long time. He said, I'm going to tell you what nobody else is going to tell you. And, you know, and no, you're not going to hear this anywhere. And, and uh, so I, my head goes in, I listen to him, my ears perk up. And he says, here's what you do to whatever songs you want to, want to produce. He says, take it, get an MP3 of that song. And he says, go right to your DAW, go into your recording thing and take that song in there. And he says, and then sync up, you know, what, how, what's the tempo of it, yeah. what, everything. And he says, and then play what the kick drum's playing, play yes. what the hi hat's playing, yes. play what the bass is playing. He says, you can change the chords a little bit if you want, don't want it to be copying them completely. So I went home after that. And I, for the next month, I took, I can't remember who it was at that time, maybe Pink, Maroon 5, or prob probably. Uh, 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 Matchbox 20. I took like yeah. you know, six, seven tunes, one by one. I put them in there. I did everything that they did, only I changed the chord progression so I wasn't completely ripping them off. Right. It wouldn't matter if I was ripping because I was learning, but I changed the chord progression and I did everything. The kick drum, the snare, the, the hat, the bass uh, guitar, the guitars, the keyboards, where they were placed, the yes. reverbs, everything. Yes. When I got done with those things, I sounded like a world-class producer. And, <laughs> and I did that for a month. And after I'd done that for a month uh, with, with the various artists, some of those things were start. I learned really quickly. Some Absolutely. of those things were, were really becoming natural. But still, when I needed a new genre, um, even like the Southern Rock that I did for the um, all those duck shows, um, no, I went back and listened to Southern Rock. What are they using? They're using crunchy guitar. Is that garage band kind right. of things? The bass players using a pick most in the seventies for all that right. Southern Rock. You know what they do and reverse engineer all that stuff. But all those templates are out there. Whatever genre, if you want to do uh, flamenco music, if you want to do dramedy, if you want to do you know songs in whatever genre, go the artist, stick the thing in, learn how to do it, copy it, and tell you. You know that's what all the great painters did back in the day they copied until they got the skills and learned how to do stuff you know and even in in some universities they they'll have you do a van gogh they'll have you do a da vinci they'll have you do a, this kind of stuff to learn those skills yeah, so un unfortunately with youtube's you know music policies and copyright policies is it makes it almost impossible to teach by example you know the copyright claims and things of that sort that the various estates of artists do you the concept of fair use educated educational use is almost gone so you can't walk someone through why does you know uh why does prince sound this way or why does oscar sound this way whatever um you can't do it. But yes, you hit on something. You're the first person I've talked to in a long time that does exactly what I've done. When I when I want to learn something, I go grab a reference track. Like with taxi listings, you get three or four reference tracks. If it's a new genre, I will grab that audio, drop it into my DAW, figure out the tempo, sync it up. And these days, tempos are usually even numbers or end in five. But you can drag and click until you find the click and it works. And then you reconstruct or deconstruct, uh, dare I say demystify, the track by saying okay here's the kick is it a muffle kick a sharp kick is it an 808 kick is it a live kick is it synthetic okay there's the kick there's the hi-hat there's the there's a the snare is it crispy is it a fat snare okay let me focus on just the drums and then i'll go through the whole track and say okay does a hi-hat drop out here does the kick change where the pattern and i'll go through and i'll painstakingly recreate that okay i got the drum kit what's the bass doing what's the guitar doing I do a lot of urban stuff, trap, hip hop, et cetera. Much easier to do, I, I think, reconstructing than, than more complex stuff in pop music. But yeah, putting that in your DAW and trying to copy it, you learn how to listen critically, how to isolate your ear onto individual instruments. You start hearing, wait, there's something going on. There's a panning effect. There's a pick, a pluck. So what's that going on here? And what's the sound like? And oh, I know it's this delay, this reverb, and you get better and better. And when you're done, you've got this project in your preferred DAW it's a template. Yep. And yep. now you've got the song. So what, what I've done is I'll create this thing. I have all the tracks. I like color coding. I use logic and I'll highlight all the tracks and make them dark blue or dark maroon, whatever, and say, okay, when I change it to my own, 
I make it green as I've changed it. And, and so I go through and change all the stuff so that it's okay. unique to me. I follow their structure, but all the music is unique. Now I've got a new track that's all mine, original, based on a established standard, a preference from my client, et cetera. So yeah, that's that's a huge takeaway. For you watching out there, drag tracks into your DAW and copy them. Transcribing is an amazing thing i transcribed hundreds of solos as a saxophone player guitar players do the same thing with eddie van halen or west montgomery etc oscar peterson joe pass you know uh you 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 learn by emulating those that you like or respect or want to sound like so i'm glad to hear you go down absolutely that's that is the way to to learn how to produce and compose this stuff and it, it also use that same philosophy that same skill to learning chord structures to learning melodies to learning lyrics what lyrics are being used in sync? You know, if you're just doing it for yourself and want to be on the radio or, or you know, then, and, then write whatever songs you want to write, write whatever you want. But if you're doing it for sync, you're trying to hit a target. And then it can, that same philosophy can be used for, for all aspects. And that's important. And, and this is something that I think a lot of younger musicians need to understand. This is a service industry. We're not trying to sell our art. We are trying to be not artists, but artisans. And we have to deliver a product that the client wants. If you're playing a wedding and it's the first dance and it's what's new or some beautiful jazz ballad, that is not the time for me to show the crowd my Coltrane chops on tenor and all this great stuff I can do. I'm going to play the stylistically accurate solo because that's what the client needs. When you're writing cues and you want a library or a supervisor to take your music, they're saying, I need emotional piano that sounds like this. Don't give them your version. Give them something that they're asking for. Humble yourself and deliver what they're asking. Be stylistically accurate. Respect the genre that they're trying to get you yep, to deliver. Yep, yep, yep. Give them, give them what they need. This is really a a craft. And within the craft, you get to be creative and, yes. and do your art. But it's a a, a bit, it's a craft business. And establish your fact, establish your trust, your professionalism, your ability to deliver things on time. You know, you know, act like you've been there. And, and and then when you've got that relationship, hey, you might say, hey, John Doe, library owner, I happen to do this stuff. Would you be interested in hearing it? And if they have time, they will. And if not, move yep. on. Don't be hurt by it. Yep. Um, it's a little longer than I wanted, but this has been great, Dean. It's wonderful to talk to you about the business. Oh, um, you. Uh, you. One more question I'd like to ask yep. you. Um, the music industry continues to change. Uh, the, some may say that this, the sync market, the sync industry in general is saturated. I know the beat market seems to be saturated in, in hip hop, but some folks say the TV sync market is saturated partially because the tools have gotten so good. The DAWs, everything in the box, the software libraries, et cetera, the sample libraries, uh, they get better and better exposing creative tools to more and more folks. Um, we also have to consider uh, the impact of artificial intelligence is starting to play uh, in, in what it could do to the industry. Um, I think AI today, being a tech guy, can create drones, can create ambient piano. I've heard some interestingly useful cocktail jazz trio stuff yeah. that if you put it low in the mix, the background, you have no idea that it was yeah. artificially generated. It scares the heck out of me. Yeah. Um, but I think AI is just another tool that we can learn how to use versus become victimized by. But how do you see the industry changing and what are you doing to keep yourself relevant in the industry? I think that, uh, I think you are right. And, and, you know, I've been spouting off about AI for almost 10 years now. Yeah. And every, every musician I know is laughing at me that, oh, it'll never replace this. It'll never, I'm like, well, oh, you mean the car will never replace the horse and buggy? Is that what you're saying? Thank you. You know, um, no, it it will. What, what impact it has, I don't know. We don't. We don't know. Time will tell. Um, I think there'll be a a resistance for a while from uh, uh, from music supervisors, TV shows, movies for for using that. They'll still want the old, you know, people to do that. But at the end of the day, money will probably rule in that. But I my my uh, um, gut thing. It, it, what I'm telling myself and what I tell other people is. Um, do great stuff. Just do perf- make great music, and great music usually will find a home, at least in the coming years. Yeah. And, um, and there's so many new opportunities that are gonna gonna open up in the next ten years. Um, I, I tr- you know, what will AI? I don't know what AI will do, but certainly AI is gonna be able. I just saw a thing the other day where this guy had used AI to sample uh, Eminem's voice, and he put it on a uh, um, uh, 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 rave type track, 
Yep. EDM tribe track. And I went, Oh my gosh, that sounds like Eminem. And I, I think I saw the same video. It was, a, it was went, a that video is, about somebody. That's unbelievable. So we know that stuff is coming. Now there's going to be one thing that's really going to slow it down. There's going to be tons of copyright issues with that. Right. So they're not just going to be able to go right through the gate with that kind of stuff and use it, but make great stuff. And, and right now we have film and TV and video games and, and ads uh, to produce music for um, AI and virtual reality is coming right down the pike. Uh, it's already here on games, but there is going to be a day coming soon where there's a company out of Florida called Magic Leap, um, and it's a, a, a augmented reality company. And they now they instead of putting a big hollow lens on your like Microsoft has, they have glasses just like that that you put on, and it's augmented reality. Wow. And I envision in the next uh, five to ten years. We will sit in our room at our house, our living room, our whatever, whatever wherever we watch TV or wherever we, we watch, uh, you know, look at our videos on our iPads. And we'll have three dimensional actors coming through and engaging with us, walking right through our houses. Um, <laughs> all that's the good news for us is all that's going to need music. All it's going to all yes. that's going to need sound. So, you know, right when I first started, hit there, you know, what, how many networks are there in streaming, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Right. You know, when, when I was a little kid, there were what, like, you know, six channels or seven channels or something like that that, that, yeah. that you could watch. And um, so, yeah, there's new things coming, but embrace it. Embrace it. You know, I mean, uh, they, they when the electric guitar came out back in the, whenever it was, the 50s, um, they thought, oh, that's the end of horns. It's going to replace all horn sections forever. Well, no, it didn't. It changed music and things changed. And but horn players still found a way. They found new ways. They found, right. uh, you know, they, they had the old things. They had the big bands, all that cool stuff. And then they found a new kind of jazz, a new kind of stuff. So um, this stuff is coming. It's here. But you know, just just uh, keep reinventing yourself and be aware and, and look at all the new stuff. And you know, change change happens whether we want it to or not. You know, exactly. I'm, exactly I'm, I mean, but things are kind of the same. You know, I you probably remember the days of of going to blockbuster video and yep. okay, I want to, I want a movie there, but I don't know what I want. And you spend 20 minutes looking, for all these, <laughs> you know, and now I go on, you know, Netflix or Amazon prime and I spend 20 minutes trying to look for what, what movie do I want to, you know, so things change, but they say the same. Will we still be creating music 10 years from now? Yes, we will. Might it look a little different how we do it, how we do it. Yeah, probably will. And there'll probably be some difference in it, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, um, I'm not giving up on it. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I, I see. Uh, you know, AI. You know, I, I'm a big fan of Native Instruments and Contact. I think I'm. I'm on an older version of Contact. I think Contact's up to version 13, version 13. I can see Contact 17 coming out, and there's the AI plugin module where you right, can use right, it. Right. And then I was talking to Steve, our friend Steve Barden about this. And he said, look, there's already AI. You can buy orchestral libraries that have ostinatos built in and, and string sequencing things built in and use play and hit your modulation wheel. And you've got different various ostinatos and, and, and plucking patterns, et cetera. So it's already starting to happen. To me, AI, artificial intelligence, is only as smart as the folks training it, as biased as the folks training it. That's a whole separate topic. Uh, but I, AI is a tool, I think, that we need to learn how to use and adapt to our yeah. benefit versus being victimized by it. I completely agree. It's a force not to be messed with. We have, you know, kiosks at McDonald's now instead of people taking your order. Yeah. We have cars that can drive themselves. Hell, we've had flying planes that could fly us all over years, but no one's going to get in a plane without a pilot in a right. cockpit. Um, the technology is there to do certain things. So we have to get out in front of it and learn how to embrace it. Yep. And and have that 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 tool in our toolkit to say yes because like you said earlier the money will follow why would a big studio do a brief and say let's deal with the musicians when I can push a couple of key commands and please generate you know fifty two and a half minute drones of this style and boom there they all these MP3s are done with no ownership no contracts no personalities etc so you know I, I, contact I seventeen drone generating. I say the same thing to to uh, to everybody out there that's watching. I mean, embrace the new stuff, learn how to use it, and keep evolving with it. It's 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 only going to replace you if you if you let it completely. Now, now, different. And the example I'll give is you know technology. Let's go back 120 years 
when there was a, a you know out in the farm field and you had a uh, um, hundred workers working to harvest this this uh, weed or whatever it was in there. Then all of a sudden, somebody had this big machine that they invented that could come in, and so you know, ninety five of those hundred workers got laid off, and there were only five people now running th this thing. It says, oh no, technology is ruining it. We're losing jobs. We're losing everything. But now those 95 people, somebody had to make that machine. Somebody had to repair that machine. Somebody had to deliver that machine. Somebody had to do the next. So those the, the jobs change or the part of the industry that they were in might have shifted a little bit. But, um, you know, and I think the, 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 the challenge we face with all technology is that, you know, back in the day, 120 years ago, it took 20, 30, 40 years for something to change. And now right. man, something could change in less than a year. So, you know, it's, it's sped up a little I bit. I think you have to, a general theme I'm, I'm hearing talk to my peers is you have to have the ability to adapt. Adapt. Um, adapt. You can't be stubborn. Yeah. What's that? What's that line? I can't remember the movie, but it's adapt or die. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the case. I, I know that quote as well. Um, so that's it. Well, Dean, this has been a fantastic conversation. Sorry, I'm a little long as far as your schedule goes, but this is great content and we're trying to pay it forward to our, our peers and the, yep. the folks yep. in the industry. Um, I'll be sure, you know, for those watching, I've got links to Dean's books in the description. You know, I didn't mention all the books you've got, you demystifying the cue, demystifying the genre, and then uh, write, submit, forget, repeat, yeah. excuse me, which is the taxi mantra. Are you the father of that? Is that your creation? Oh, no, it's, it's, no. Uh, I wish I, I wish I was, but no, I'm not even, and no, and nobody at taxi is either. You go into any gift store where they, you know, they sell to authors and things. There's a ver variation of that is, is everywhere. And it, it's repeat. Thing, it's like, right? it's, you've got yeah. to put the ego aside, consider yourself a servant yeah. to the client. Yeah. You're, we're delivering a service, be traditional and true to your genres, study the genres, stay relevant, work hard. This is not easy, but you can be successful. Dean Crippane, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure to see your face. I'm glad we got the chance to talk and I look forward to chat with you and working with you again in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks. Mm -hmm.